Welcome, fans and foes, viewers and haters. I'm your cinema simpleton because these days, even Hollywood can't fool an idiot. Recently, I was lent the Rocky Collection on DVD and was able to watch all six films back to back. I was so impressed with the franchise, I just had to tell you guys what I thought about it. But there's not really a point in me doing a marathon because most of the story structures in the films are less complex than making pancakes. Challenge, climax, Adrian! Challenge, climax, Adrian! Challenge, climax, okay, that's not fair. So instead, what I'm gonna do is give you a rundown of my basic thoughts on the six movies. The first Rocky movie rightfully earned the award for Best Picture in 1976, giving Sylvester Stallone the combined image of both big and tough, but also that of a kooky everyman. It's the story of Balboa, an up-and-coming Philadelphia boxer who gets a shot at taking on the world heavyweight champion Apollo Creed, played by Carl Weathers. Most of the movie is him preparing for the fight, as well as getting close with his girlfriend Adrian, played by Talia Shire. Settle down, boys! Surprisingly, she does get hotter as the movies go on. Also joining Rocky for the ride is Burt Young in the role of Polly, Adrian's brother. You're going to notice something very consistent with Polly throughout the series. What you do for Polly? Anything? Three years if you gave me a job? Me, Polly! I was responsible! Is there something the matter with me? The hell with everybody. This place is disgusting. Why don't we stay at your place? I don't like these people. Maybe they don't like you either, Polly. That's right, Polly likes to chew cigars. And on the subject of recurring stuff coming out of his mouth, he never shuts. Up! You can keep me down! Okay, I'll play fair. It's Polly's grumpy attitude when matched with Rocky's upbeat character that makes their interaction worthwhile in every film. But come on, the guy gets a frigging android in the fourth flick and he's still complaining! I so stupid. You're stupid! Throughout the series are other supporting characters, but they were often recasted or killed off as time went on. Polly's the only one who stuck through till the end with Rock. No. Matter. What. And that's exactly the continuing moral message that starts with the first Rocky movie. Going the distance to prove yourself to everyone that you're more than what people think you are. You're a fighter. And then the moral's just about winning by the time the sequel rolls around. Yeah, remember that rematch Apollo promised Rocky wasn't gonna happen at the end of the first movie? Well, they made a whole frickin' film about it! So, yeah, you can guess that a significant chunk of the sequel has a familiar structure in comparison with the first movie. But thankfully, Stallone took the helm of both writer and director and decided to develop a more mature and at times vulnerable character. His control over the franchise would lead to him adding his own personal touch to a character he knows inside and out. But the difference this time around with the plot is that it constantly dodges the whole rematch story arc for too long when you know it's coming. It just delays the inevitable for an hour and frankly, you get pretty restless waiting. But for the returning characters, we get to feel a bit more sympathy towards them and a little bit more insight is shown, such as Apollo and Rocky's manager Mickey, played by Burgess Meredith. Aha, the old and wizened Mickey, the Yoda, the Liam Neeson figure, the... I want you to try to, to chase this little chicken. Go on and get him! Get him, get him, get him! Come on, what's the matter with you? Get him! Liberator of poultry. I think I've said enough about this movie. Alright, here we go. This is it. Right here. My favorite of the series, Rocky 3. Hey, I was surprised too. Usually the third round tanks in my opinion. And while this one isn't the worst of the series, it doesn't have that much ecstatic praise as the two before it. I don't know, maybe it's because Rocky 3 is the first of the movies to have him starting out with a wealthy status, whereas the last movie showed that if you put a fast car and a leather jacket in Rocky's hands, he'll end up with a street full of roadkill and... a leather jacket. Well now that he's a boxing champion, Balboa spends his days signing autographs, beating the crap out of Hulk Hogan in the name of charity, and popping ego pills. But his fame is challenged when he's suddenly confronted by a professional boxer unlike any he's ever faced. Mostly because he's only fought one professional boxer. And that fighter's name is... Clubber Lang! 
Oh, sweet mucus. Yes, people, that's him. That is him. That is Mr. T in a freaking Rocky movie. And you best believe this dude is a juggernaut in the ring. He's huge. He's fierce. And the cherry on top of it all is this guy hates everybody. I mean, sure, he has no three-dimensional motivation as the antagonist, but uh, permit me to respond with T! Just listen to this guy. This is the scene where he's being held back in the ring from beating the stallion stuffing out of Rocky. I'll kill you, man! What the heck is happening to him? Is he passing a kidney stone? It's a freaking boxing match! As far as I'm concerned, the recipe for this movie's screenplay could not be better. The villain's a machine, the character arc for Balboa is great, and there's plenty to invest yourself into. And the thought of two rivals working together to take down this giant just leaves me with goosebumps. Most underrated Rocky movie ever! And now for the ratings. The first Rocky movie gets a 5 out of 5 for being a colossal first stepping stone into the franchise. Rocky 2 gets one point knocked off for a very familiar story arc but still turning out to be a great show. And finally, Rocky 3 gets a rating of 5 out of 5 for an awesome film. I would have also given it a 4 out of 5 for its shameless marketing of Survivor's Eye of the Tiger song, but frankly, I'd be disappointed not to have that thing stuck in my head. You're searching it up on YouTube right now, aren't you? That's because I'm psychic. Nah, nah, I'm just kidding. There's a camera in your house. Welcome fans and foes, viewers and haters. I'm your cinema simpleton because these days even Hollywood can't fool an idiot. Let's get back on track. If you've seen the third Rocky movie, then you know we left off with Balboa earning a friendship with former rival Apollo Creed and learning not to box in the name of avenging a dead loved one. Morals to live by, aren't they? Well, let's just say that this here is the morals of Rocky 3, and this magic little box it's the contents of Rocky IV. Yes, folks, what we have here is the movie the fans probably remember the most. Sylvester Stallone vs. Dolph Lundgren the latter of whom was supposedly cast from a selection of not six, not seven, but 8,000 candidates. In Rocky IV, when we're not watching a James Brown music video, we're seeing the Soviet Union send their towering boxer, Ivan Drago, to face America's champions. Rocky, who's apparently comfortable with retirement, steps aside to give Apollo Creed the shot at taking Drago on, and supports him ringside as his friend promptly fights his way to become... A LEAKING CARCASS! Uh, yeah, Apollo's dead now. Just when Rocky's starting to respect this guy as a fellow athlete, he flatlines. And the worst part is, after Apollo's death, he's barely talked about or referenced again. Was Rocky just looking for an excuse to go pummel a Russian? Now, you might think that I'm exaggerating with that point, but look at it from the perspective of the viewer. This movie is jam-packed with a political message due to the U.S. and the USSR not being on very friendly terms during the time the movie's set in. Now I'm all for letting movies have a message between the lines, but do you mind if I ask what the heck Rocky has to do with the Cold War?! The patriotism is so forced in this movie that just sitting through the song Living in America makes me feel like somebody's gonna hold me down and tattoo red, white, and blue to my forehead. But when it comes to the Russians, they imply that Drago is cheating through the use of steroids and they're being represented by a breathing action figure who has no remorse for manslaughter. If he dies, if he dies. But like all the Rocky movies, it's the final fight that kept everybody's butts in the theater. And even though the other ones had Rocky defying the odds again and again, it's this boxing match where Balboa's persistence just doesn't add up. He has no strategy, he's not dodging the hits. The only clue that we get as to how he still conscience is... No pain! No pain! No pain! No pain! No pain. No pain. Okay, take it to us. 
No pain? That's it? This ain't no mind over matter crap we're talking about here. How hard did they say that Drago could hit? Drago averages 1,850 pounds. That's a lot of pain! And on the subject of torture, we lead into Rocky V, the only movie in the series to lose money at the box office. See, due to his last fight with Drago, the doctors have now diagnosed Rocky with brain damage, so his boxing days are pretty well over. So much for no pain, huh? And you think that's bad? Guess what happened while Rocky was away in Russia? All of his money is gone because it was signed over to someone who lost it all in a real estate scheme. Are you wondering who it was that signed over the Balboas to bankruptcy? Well, I'll give you a hint. His name starts with Polly and it ends in DUR! So the family moves back to the Philadelphia streets and Rocky takes over Mickey's old gym where he starts training a young fighter named Tommy Gunn, played by real life boxer Tommy Morrison. So if you haven't figured it out by now, the majority of this boxing movie, Rocky doesn't box! This is a very forgettable addition to the film series. Little gets accomplished, and though the movie goes for the angle of Rocky trying to learn to value his family most, it goes in a very dull pacing, and the script just doesn't pull off the drama that well. And Tommy Gunn isn't some likable protege either, because you can tell by the beginning that this guy's got some serious anger issues, and the fame goes straight to his head. He's no new Balboa, he's like some fanboy who's just following him around. According to IMDB.com, Stallone himself considers this film a letdown, giving it a 0 out of 10 in an interview. Hey man, quit stealing my gig! I don't walk on the set of Expendables and start busting Steve Austin's face up, do I? Well, that's mostly because you got a pretty good security team, but hey, that's not the point! Now, with all the negative things to say about Rocky V, there's one silver lining that I just can't pass up talking about. Mixed up in this whole protege storyline is a fight promoter by the name of George Washington Duke. Now maybe it's just because we're in a boxing movie, but whenever this guy talks, I find something very familiar about him. You do have marquee value, you put butts in the buckets, asses in the seats. A yeah. businessman with any sort of brain don't retire when you can still pull in the bread, baby. Nothing yet? Well, let's give it a minute. There's nothing in the boxing business more commercial than a long shot comeback of a down on his luck, pure snow white on the dog. No, 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 listen to me. There's a way for you to get the respect you deserve, but what you got to do is challenge Balboa to fight and man to man. Then you gotta insult him. You gotta dog him. You gotta humiliate him. You gotta do whatever you got to do to get him into that ring, but that's what you got to do. Because only in America do we get these kind of opportunities. Only in America. Only in America. Every lightning speed line this guy delivers just leaves me laughing. If they gave him more scenes, it just might have been worth the price of a ticket. But unfortunately, the director, who this time wasn't Stallone, unfortunately didn't realize how good of a thing he had. But the one part that makes any Rocky movie complete is the montage with the song Gonna Fly Now mixed over it. Well guess what? We don't get it! Cause Rocky don't get no montage, and the song's only played by a marching band. This is the most un-Rocky movie of all the Rocky movies! And so we reach the conclusion of the Balboa tale, the sixth movie, Rocky Balboa. Over 15 years have passed since the previous match, and while Rocky's fame hasn't been forgotten, his emotional state is at a low. Adrian has died from cancer, his son, now played by Milo Ventimiglia, is trying to earn a place in the world without his father's image over him, and to top it off... The hell with everybody! HIM! In his search for a way to fight away the anger and the grief, Balboa gets the idea to make a comeback into boxing. Despite everybody telling him he's far too old to be able to get back in the ring, he agrees to have an exhibition fight with the current heavyweight champion of the world, Mason Dixon, played by actual boxer Antonio Tarver. And throughout the entire movie, the supporting characters and the audience are holding their breath to see just how much Rocky's got left in him. Now, I know that when it comes to Balboa, he's a fictional character and his chances are moldable to any Hollywood script. But look at the shape Stallone is in this movie! He is chiseled like a bronze statue! Check out the behind the scenes footage of this man working out. I swear, you're gonna gain some newfound respect for how awesome this guy is. This movie was also the start of a series of what I like to call the comeback sequels to franchises we had all but forgotten. Ninja Turtles, Rambo, Die Hard, The Unspeakable, it all brought back a sense of nostalgia to Hollywood that we much appreciated. 
With Stallone back in the writer and director's chairs, he gave a darker atmosphere to Rocky's world but retained the same classic attitude that hasn't aged a bit. It also let the characters that had had very minor roles in the franchise step up in this film and give them their own significance. Fans have viewed this movie as being one of the best of the series, giving both the former and current generation respect for Rocky's character. And because the last fight was choreographed to look like an athletic boxing match, it didn't leave the audience rolling their eyes as they would have if they adapted one of the former movies into the modern era. And to top it off, the movie's credits were shown alongside footage of real people climbing the famous Rocky steps and posing as the Italian Stallion himself. Hey, Stallone? Stallion? Dude, I just got that! In closing, the Rocky series is one that many people pick when it comes to the underdog sports genre. Yeah, the plots and the fights get pretty repetitive, and you could probably turn Rocky's attempts to retire throughout the series into a drinking game, but I think it's the protagonist himself that keeps people coming back to him all these years. Rocky's just always been this optimistic, hilarious guy with plenty of heart and endurance. He starts out as a big brother you wish you had, and by the last movie, he's like some kooky uncle you'd just love to hang out with. And now to the business of the ratings. Rocky IV gets a 2.5 out of 5 for being a very bizarre but still acceptable term for the series. Rocky V gets a 1.5 out of 5 for having some effort but just not having the same quality as the classics. You could go ahead and skip this one and go straight to the 6th and you wouldn't be missing out on much. And lastly, Rocky Balboa earns a rightful 5 out of 5 for being a good drama and bringing Rocky back to a respectable state. Not just clobbering some new boxer, but also giving hope to the fighters of today.